How many of you have ever run out of gas in your car? Let me see a show of hands. How many people have ever run out of gas? Okay, that's, that's a lot. That's a lot of people. That's a lot of people. All right. How many of you have done it? I mean, some of you are like, oh, when I was a kid. No, how many of you have done it within the last five years? Five years. Keep your hands up. In the last five years. Three. In the last three years. How many have done it this year? This year. Keep, keep those hands high. How many have done it this year? In the last two months? <laughs> I mean, Pastor Robin is the last one with his hand raised. We have, Pastor Robin, we have a gift for you. We have a gas card. <laughs> Uh, because, you know, there's nothing worse than running out of gas, right? <laughs> he does have a lot of cars, and not a lot of them, or a lot of them don't have a lot of gas. Um, but it's a bummer to run out of gas, isn't it? I remember last, last summer, I took our family to up to the Black Hills area, but first stopped through Scott's Bluff and did that whole thing. And so I, I always knew driving through Nebraska on I-80 is not really an exciting drive, right? But, um, uh, but when you get off I-80 and drive through western Nebraska through like uh, small highways, that's like scary. Like there is nothing out. I remember at one moment like going, Okay, we've got a decent amount of gas, but I have not seen a farmhouse in 20 minutes. I've not seen another car in 45 and a gas station in an hour. If I run out of gas, I'm in trouble, right? And if to run out of gas in that situation is a pretty, is, is, is you know, there'd be a, a, it'd be unfortunate. Or just put it that way, it'd be very unfortunate, right? And, and though running out of gas in town is bad too, it, it, you're always a little ways away from you know walking somewhere. But running out in town is way more embarrassing, isn't it? <laughs> Especially when you got twenty dollars in your pocket <laughs> and the needle is like you know a quarter inch below empty, and you run out of gas. Who are you going to complain to? Come on, right? I mean, you knew it. You should have known better. But you go, you know what? Okay, I'm late for an appointment. And if I just, I just need to get here, here, and here. And I think I can do that before I run out of gas. I don't have time to stop for gas. Well, you really don't have time to run out of gas. It's really the issue, right? You run out of gas. Ah, oh, it's a bummer. It's one you don't really complain about or post on Facebook because you're going to get made fun of, right? You should know better. Don't run out of gas. Have you ever, have you ever physically just kind of like run out of gas? <laughs> Like, you've just been going so hard that you just, like, got to a wall and, like, I can't go any further? I mean, I, I remember the first, okay, this was a number of years ago, and, and I remember I was going, 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 right? You, you guys have all been there before, right? Late nights, early morning, big responsibility, don't really have time for a day off, so I just push on through, and, then, and part of it's just the physical drive, part of it's the, the emotional weight, right, of like the responsibility, you got, oh, you got these things to do, or people pulling at you a thousand different directions, and you just, you're going, you're going, going, and, and I can handle it for a while, right? I can handle it for, a week goes by, and okay, I'm tired, but I can keep on pressing in. And two, three weeks go, a couple months go by, and you're just pushing, pushing, pushing. I remember one time, it was in the middle of all this, I started to get a little bit of a cold. And, and, um, and, and it, I wasn't handling it really well, but like you started to just wear it out and slow down and lose energy, and I just started to feel not good. And I got too much to do to get sick. Ugh. I was like, well, what hurts? Uh, I felt like a four-year-old, like not being able to, I don't know, I don't feel good, <laughs> And, and, and like body aches and no energy and just like crash. Like, all right, I, I don't have time. I, I need to go to bed early. And I go to bed early and I sleep in. And then I get up and I take a two-hour nap. And then I go to bed early and then I sleep in. And for two days, I just slept straight. And I woke up and went, hey, I feel good. <laughs> Well, I didn't think much of it, and I just kept on. I, got, I felt better, so I kept on, and I just kept on pushing, and I kept on going the same way. And about six months later, the exact same sickness hit me again. And all of a sudden, I realized, oh, maybe there's, there's a connection between these two things. My body and your body it was designed by God to need rest. And if you do not give it the rest that God intended it to have, you are going to crash somewhere. And you know what I, what, I, what I found out and what I see in Scripture, what we're going to look at today is that rest is the fuel 
the powers that gives us the power to engage in the world that we're in. The rest is that, that same kind of fuel that gives us the power to engage. Now, last week, Pastor Jim, thank you, Pastor. Didn't he do a fabulous job last week of, of sharing the word with us? Um, Beth and I were away help, uh, raising some funds for, for a Guatemala trip, and, um, and Pastor Jim just taught on, on the story of the feeding the 5,000. And I love to look at the stories of Jesus, right, and what he does and how he handles circumstances. And it's just so powerful, the principles you can learn from the stories. Now, two weeks ago, we, we looked at Jesus' teaching, and we talked about how, how oftentimes we wrestle with doubt, and Jesus gave us this, this rich, thick teaching about these evidences of who he is. And, and, and man, I love the teachings of Jesus, but sometimes I'm captured not just by the stories of Jesus and not just by the teachings of Jesus, but just by Jesus. Not just by what he does and not just by what he says, but just how he does it. And, and if you look at John chapter 6, which is the text we're going to be in today, so you can turn your Bibles there. Uh, if, if you look at John chapter 6, I mean, anybody really could read it. If you can read, you could, you could divide it into three nice, easy, clean sections to preach, right? You get, first, you have, you have two stories in teaching. You have a story of the feeding of 5,000. You got a story of Jesus walking on water. Then you, got a sto- then you got the teaching of Jesus being the bread of life. It's really simple, really easy. So I knew after the feeding of the 5,000 comes Jesus walking on water. But as I'm reading the text... Uh, over the last few weeks, I kept tripping over this phrase, and I couldn't let it go. It, it's a phrase that, that, that it just it, it caused some questions to, to rise up inside of me that I, that I needed to have answered. And as much as I wanted to move on to the next chunk of text, I, I ended up getting caught here. So today we're only going to take two verses. And these two verses, they're not a story necessarily. They're not a teaching per se, it's just a transition. And yet in this transition, we see something I believe is very, very powerful. Now, there's a couple things going on in this text that we're going to look at in John chapter 6. The first, we see the, it's right after the feeding of 5,000. So we're talking, and again, as Pastor Jim mentioned, it's not really, we call it the feeding of 5,000, just maybe out of tradition. But as, as Pastor Jim pointed out last week, that Matthew says 5,000 men plus women and children. We're talking 10, 15, 25, up to 25,000 people potentially. This is the feeding of the thousands. I'll keep saying 5,000. You know what I mean. All right. Um, so this is right after the thousands have been fed. The 12 baskets were, were picked up afterwards. The very next verse is verse 14. We see the people's response to the miracle. But what I really want us to look at, and we'll look at that, the people's response in a couple weeks, but what I really want us to focus in on is let's just look at Jesus. What is Jesus doing here? Verse 14, after the people saw the miraculous sign that Jesus did, they say, they began to say, surely this is the prophet who is to come into, who is to come into the world. That sounds all right. Their application is a little off, as we're about to see. Jesus, knowing that they intended to come and make him king by force, withdrew again to a mountain by himself. There's that phrase, withdrew again. What is that all about? Withdrew again. What does it mean to to withdraw in that situation? Why did he withdraw? Here it is. This is one of the few miracles that are listed in all four books of the Bible. The, The gospel writers saw something in this miracle that was powerful and big and people know about this miracle and thousands were were fed with this and this creative miracle and 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 it's powerful big and exciting and Jesus runs off I mean this is like celebration time not runaway time this is like time to like you know go get an ice cream cone and celebrate the victory with the team right that's that's what this story is and yet Jesus just in fact, in Mark, which is which Mark 6, in fact, we're going to be in Mark 6. You can probably turn, I faked you out. We're probably going to be in Mark 6 more than John 6. It's the same story. Um, but Mark 6 says this about what happens afterwards, about that same event. They, they finished feeding the 5,000. It says this. Mark puts it this way. Immediately, Jesus made his disciples get into the boat. He made his disciples get into the boat and go on ahead of him to Bethsaida while he dismissed the crowd. 
And then after leaving them, he went up on a mountainside to pray. So John just said he withdrew again to a mountainside. Mark says, he gives us a more vivid picture. He, he takes his disciples. He's like, get in the boats. Get out of here. Go, 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 go. I'll, I'll catch up later. And then he turns to the crowd and says, all right, guys, get out of here. Show's over. Party's done. Go home. And he runs off into the mountains by himself. Weird response to a super cool miracle, isn't it? And so... This just got me thinking. This had me asking some questions. And, and so I started doing some digging. So today what I want us to do, I want us to dig in together a little bit. And I want us to look at the life of Jesus. Well, that sounds too philosophical. How about the day? Let's, let's get this practical. The day of, he was a son of God, but, but he was a man. What did Jesus' day look like? That led him to the point where at the end of the day, after this incredible miracle, he was like, I've got to get away. See, John, all the gospel writers, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, tell the story of Jesus. They all, you know, John, at the end of John, it says there's so many stories of Jesus that, that all the books in the, in the world could not contain everything that he did and said. So each of them, they, they pick and choose what stories they're going to tell. And, but they all tell this story, and they all tell it a little bit different. They all give a little bit different detail. Mark, I, I believe, has the most um, complete story of this day and the events surrounding what happened on this day. So we're going we're gonna to look there mostly. But uh, if you're taking notes, if you want to study this on your own a little bit more, Matthew chapter 14 um, tells the story. Mark chapter 6, we're going to spend some time in this morning, uh, tells the story. Luke chapter 9, and then last year text, John chapter 6. And you're going to find a similar telling of this story, and the, the order of it lays is very, very um, consistent throughout this. So I'm going to pull all the pieces from all the Gospels together and just begin to tell the story as it is shown to us in Scripture. So I believe it's... Mark and Luke, Mark and Luke start off talking about the sending of the 12. So here it's been a year or so that the, the 12 have been following Jesus around. And, and uh, they've seen Jesus do some pretty incredible stuff, right? I mean, he's healing people. He's casting out demons. He's doing incredible teaching. The crowds are gathering. He's gaining popularity. And the miraculous signs are taking place. But Jesus takes in his disciples and says, okay, it's, it's done. You're no longer the crowd observing. Now you're, you're an apprentice. You're going to become a part of the game. You're going you're to get into the action. He takes the 12 and he sends them out. And this isn't just like a, uh, like a, like a one-hour afternoon ministry trip. He sends them out to go and they travel and they go as uh, essentially as missionary types, if you will. And this is what is cool about it is when Jesus sends them, it says he gives them power to, to heal and to cast out demons. And so they go out, and they go, and they preach uh, the kingdom of God, and, and all of a sudden, these signs start happening. And, and they've seen Jesus. They've seen Jesus put his hands on the blind, and they could see. They've seen Jesus say to the lame person, get up. But now, for the first time, they're doing it. it, it demons are being cast out when they tell them to leave, not just Jesus. And all of a sudden, I mean, this is like, could you imagine Seeing the supernatural take place through your words and the power of Jesus. Wow. So these guys are just incredibly excited, and they're all, and they're all over the place. They're preaching. Incredible things are happening. Well, meanwhile, back in Galilee, Jesus is, is, is hearing, get some news. John the Baptist, not John the author of this. John the author would have been among the 12, the disciples. He'd been out there doing the thing. John the Baptist had been, in, had been imprisoned earlier. And John's disciples come to Jesus. And I'm sure that Jesus could tell by the countenance and the way that they approached him that there was something probably off. And I can picture his disciples coming to Jesus and saying, Jesus, I mean, you know John, your cousin, he was in prison, but we've got bad news. He was just executed. Jesus, I'm sorry, your cousin is dead. I, I, I know Jesus is, is perfect. But he's still hurt. 
And I know that he was the son of God, but he still experienced pain. And he knew the sting of loss and the sting of death. When we see his response to his friend Lazarus died, who he knew he was going to raise from the dead, and yet he wept in sorrow. And here's his cousin. He grew up with him. They're the same age. They, they, they played together. And, and not only is it is his cousin, he's, he's, the, he's the one. His whole purpose in life is to proclaim that Jesus is coming. And, and he's lived for this moment. And now his life has been snuffed out. And he's never going to be able to see it fulfilled. And I can imagine Jesus had a very heavy heart. We don't know how exactly how many days passed, but... Shortly thereafter, the, the morning of the feeding of the 5,000 came. Disciples are still out on the trip, and they wake up, and he wakes up, and I'm sure with a heavy heart. And he starts to hear some noise coming from down the street, and, and here come all the disciples. They're, Jesus is barely rubbing the, the, the sleep out of his eyes, and all of a sudden, all of these guys start coming, and they're excited, Right? They're just pumped. They're like, hey, Jesus, oh, man, you would never believe it. Well, actually, you probably can believe it, but I couldn't believe it. And let me tell you about it. We were healing people, and demons were cast out, and they were, I mean, they were as excited as they've ever been. And they're going to Jesus like, Jesus, 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 let me tell you the story. Jesus takes his current emotional pain and he sets it to the side for just a moment. He engages with his disciples. And he allows himself to feel their joy and coach them and mentor them. And he had a responsibility to lead these guys to be the leaders of the church, and he felt that responsibility, and he stepped into that responsibility. Well, these guys, I can, I can picture them making so much racket, and they're talking about Jesus, and now all of a sudden other people are catching this, and, and everybody wants a piece of Jesus. Everybody wants, everybody wants to, to talk to him, to, to, to have him heal him, something. So, so all of a sudden these crowds start coming, and Jesus is so popular. Everybody's crowds start coming. And I, I can imagine Jesus barely has time to get all the stories from the 12 before all these crowds start coming around and, 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 and pulling on him and yanking on him and, 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 and desiring something from him and, and wanting to be healed and wanting to be touched. In fact, we see this picture in Mark chapter 6, verse 30. In Mark chapter 6, verse 30, again, this is the day, this is still before the feeding of 5,000, but it's the morning of. It says, the apostles gathered around Jesus and reported to him all that they had done and taught. And then, because so many people were coming and going, that they did not even have a chance to eat, he said to them, come with me by yourselves to a quiet place and get some rest. So they went away by themselves in a boat to a solitary place, but many who saw them leaving recognized them and ran on foot from all the towns to get there ahead of them. Okay, so we, we've got this picture, and, and all this stuff is going on. And imagine Jesus now. He wakes up with a heavy heart, still fresh suffering off uh, the sting of the loss of a family member. And his disciples come, and he has to step into responsibility and shoulder the weight of responsibility. Then all these people start coming and asking him of different things, and, and, and all of a sudden, all these people are putting this, this, this demand on his time. This isn't enough time to eat. So I don't think this was just like, oh, a couple people are crowding around, so let's just take off. You don't say we didn't have time to eat if it's 9 in the morning. You just say we had a late breakfast, <laughs> right? If you say we didn't have time to eat, we're probably talking we missed lunch. He's been spending the entire day investing and engaging in the needs of the people that were right around him. And so he's investing and he's engaging and he's, he, he's, he's meeting those needs and he's pouring himself out for all the people. And, and here he is, the responsibility of, 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 of being over the disciples and, and the, the, the strains and the demands on his time with all these people asking for different things. But all along he wakes up and he's just hurting. You felt that way before? He's like, like yeah, so much going on, and so many people pulling at you a thousand different directions and a thousand different ways, and you just wanna, you just wanna like wave the white flag and just go retreat somewhere. And yet Jesus engages each and every one who came to him. But at a certain point in time, he said, "All right, guys, here's the time. 
now we're gonna, we, we need to get away. And this is what's interesting. We, we see in John 6, we, we missed this first part. We, we see in John 6 that it says he withdrew again to the mountains by himself. I don't know what that again means. Um, we see a similar situation where he withdrew from the crowds when he was getting popular in, in John 4. Maybe he's talking about that. Maybe he's saying withdraw again, even though John didn't describe this event, but maybe he's talking about from earlier in the day when he, he can't, tried to, to, to go with his disciples. Maybe he's talking about that. Maybe he, John's just simply talking about the fact that Jesus regularly just disappeared. I mean, regularly, you'll, you'll find in the Gospels, read them through, and the disciples were looking for Jesus. He'd go hide because he needed to withdraw and be by himself. And so here comes a time he spent his whole morning engaging and fully investing in, in each and every person who came to him. But then he said, okay, here's the moment, here's the time, it is time to get away. And, and, and when we start to ask the question, what does it mean for Jesus to withdraw? I think we get some of the clues in what he says to his disciples the first time he tries to withdraw that earlier that day. Listen to what he says. Listen to what he says. He says, in, in, in Mark chapter 6, the end of verse 31, he says, come with me by yourselves. See, part of withdrawing means that we, be, that we have to be alone with Jesus. See, this is great. Church, Sunday morning, Saturday night, however you, corporate worship is wonderful. But this is not withdrawing. We're surrounded with people. There's an element of our spiritual life that is, it is so crucial that we take a step beyond gathering together, but we have regular times where we get away with him. And the invitation stands for us in the same way it stood for the disciples. I love that. Come with me by yourself. It's not just that, oh, you need to read your Bible and pray. But Jesus invites you to get away with him and spend time with him. What a, what a beautiful picture. So part of it is just being alone with Jesus. The next, it says, come with me by yourselves to a quiet place. You know, I, I hear some people say, you know, uh, in January, and I'll reference this probably a couple times here this morning. In January, we had this 30 for 30 challenge. You guys remember that who are here? We challenged everybody to spend 30 minutes a day for 30 days in prayer or in some capacity with the Lord. And uh, man, it was such a rich, very, very cool time. And some of you guys just, just, just went for it. And I know this much time, there's probably some who just had an awesome time and just kind of lingered back a little bit. I get that. But, but through that time, as we talked about spending 30 minutes a day, I, I hear people say things like, you know, I, you know, 30 minutes at one time is difficult for me, but, you know, I just kind of pray throughout my day. I pray while I'm doing this, and I pray while I'm doing that. I pray while I'm driving. I, you know, I'll talk to God here, and I'll say a little prayer here. And, you know, that's great. Stay connected with him. But there is no substitute for quiet with Jesus. There's something, I mean, Jesus specifically says, come away with me and so we can be quiet. Let's remove the distractions, let's move the things that we put before us, let's remove the crowds, let's remove the demands so that we can be quiet. Come with me by yourselves to a quiet place and get some rest. Time with Jesus, withdrawing to be with God, is not just about being with Jesus, and it's not just about being quiet. It's about finding rest. See, Jesus understood something, that rest is the fuel that gives us power to engage, and he needed that. And in a day where he was being swamped all morning long, he knew his disciples needed that, so he invited them, come with me. By yourselves to a quiet place and get some rest. And what did he do in that? Well, we, we see um, that when he did finally get away, after the feeding of the 5,000, when he sent his disciples away, even, even that he had to send his disciples away uh, eventually by the end of the day because he just needed alone time with the Father. And it says in that time he went up to the mountain to pray. Withdrawing with Jesus means that we're alone, that we're quiet, that we rest, and that we pray. absolutely necessary to living the Christian life. And th this is why I say that. Um, 
You know what we see? You know what the fourth commandment is? Anybody know off the top of your head? Honor the Sabbath. Honor the Sabbath. Good job. Honor the Sabbath um, by keeping it holy. But that's Old Testament stuff. We don't have to acknowledge that, right? That's, that's, that's Old Testament stuff. Yeah, sure. But there are principles that God designed. Kind of like I get sick when I go too long without resting. That's God's intention because he designed us to be people who need rest. And it's not just rest like, okay, you got to slow down, but rest like I want to be with you. And Jesus invites us into that rest. I, I, want, I, want, to, I want to reference this here real quick. You know, in, in Psalm chapter 95, um, it's a really interesting picture that, that I'm just going to reference. I'm not even going to read it. I don't want to say think. Um, Psalm 95, it's talking about the, the, the children of Israel in the wilderness, right? They, they leave Egypt, and they're wandering in the wilderness. And the goal is to make it to the promised land, right? When we think of the promised land, we think of the land of blessing. We think of the land of prosperity. We think of the land of fullness. We think of the land of everything that's being taken care of. And yet, the, and yet in, in, in Psalm chapter 95, Paul, or God references the promised land as not entering prosperity and not entering blessing, but entering rest. And he says, those who rebelled at me, they never enter my rest. Well, that's still Old Testament. Well, the author of Hebrews, I will turn here. The author of Hebrews in Hebrews chapter 4 says this. You're getting much more of a Bible study than our Saturday night group got, but I kind of ignore this. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 4 now, read all of chapter 4. You want to study this? Read Hebrews chapter 4. It's powerful. I'm just going to pick little pieces of it for the sake of time. Hebrews 4, 4 says, For somewhere he's spoken about the seventh day in these words, and I'm sure you'll be familiar with this, and on the seventh day God rested from all his work. Verse 6. It still remains, in the New Testament, it still remains that some will enter that rest, and those who formerly had the gospel preached to them did not go in because of their disobedience. Verse 9. There remains then a Sabbath rest for the people of God. For anyone who enters God's rest will rest from his own work, just as God did from his. Let us therefore make every effort to enter that rest so that no one will fall by following their example of disobedience. Do you notice that? Let us enter the rest so that no one will fall. All right, so what does this mean? Does this mean go to church on Sunday? Not exactly. It could include that. That's not exactly what it's referring to. Um, you know, something that was just spoken into me, and, and I, I just am so, so thankful for, for godly men who've, who've walked the path before me that I can listen to, have really encouraged me to just really have a Sabbath day where I rest. I mean, this is Sabbath and Sunset, and we worship together, but let's just be honest, okay? I love you guys. It's fun to be here, but I'm working right now, okay? Um, <laughs> I need a day of rest. And so, it, you know, I've, just, I've chosen to, to make, make uh, Monday my, my Sabbath day of rest. And, and every, every December, the first week in December, there's, there's a sabbatical retreat that, that RMI and, and Grady here um, puts together, a men's retreat. We just go and we, we, it's a, a, a retreat to simply retreat and hear from God. It's powerful. I encourage you to set aside some days to go. Um, but one of the things that God spoke to me, and he always speaks when you give him time to do so, uh, he spoke to me very, very clearly um, last December, and he said this. He says, I want you to Sabbath every day. And I'm like, sweet, I'm quitting my job. <laughs> <laughs> but what he was referring to is that rest. And we see that in the life of Jesus. I'm sure he honored the Sabbath. But over and over and over and over in the life and the story and the narrative of Jesus and the transition points between story to story, we find the disciples are looking for Jesus because he knew the value of rest. Not to make it this holy tradition like, like the Pharisees had done, but rather understanding the value and the principle that rest is fuel that powers every other part of my life. To rest every day. To simply be with him. To answer that invitation when he says, come by yourself, come with me by yourself to a quiet place and rest. 
Let's keep going. We got we to get through the story. <laughs> So they hop in the boat and they go. But as we see, the, the crowds heard that he was going across, so they beat him there. Now, I want you to picture this, right? So you just worked hard all week long. Monday through Friday, you're just putting in your time, long days. And it just seemed like every single day this week that there was something else. Maybe there was a church event. Maybe there was somebody else that you need. You had to help a, a relative move. You had to babysit the neighbor's kid. You, I mean, you were just going nonstop all week long. But you knew that after work on Friday, you're going to dinner with some close friends where you didn't have to be on. You, you know what I mean? Some friends you got to be on with. Some friends you can just like be yourself, you know. You're going with those friends, those close people, and, and you're ready to begin to unwind. You have dinner, you're relaxing, you're enjoying yourself, and you're ready for a weekend of nothing because you're planning to rest. And you get home from dinner, and standing in your yard are 20,000 people who all want something different from you. Could you imagine that? I mean, that's what happened here. Jesus says, hey, we're going to take the day and we're going to go rest. And I'm sure it was great hanging out in the little boat ride across the Sea of Galilee. And hey, they probably told stories. And Jesus, I could imagine Jesus sitting in the back and be like, guys, can somebody else roll this time? I just got to take a break, right? And so they're, they're going across the sea. They're enjoying each other's company, getting ready for a time of rest. And they show up and there's more people there than when they left. And the disciples respond kind of like I probably would. Hey, we're supposed to be resting here. Get out of here. But Jesus is like, whoa. whoa, whoa. It says that Jesus saw the crowd. Luke says he welcomed them. Matthew and Mark says he had compassion on them. If it happened to me, <laughs> oh, it's a good thing I'm not Jesus. All right. Um, but Jesus saw them. And he welcomed them. And he had compassion on them. And he engaged them. He was aware of his surroundings. He was present in the moment. He saw the physical need, but he saw deeper than the physical need. He saw a spiritual need. He saw an emotional need that he knew he had the capacity to meet. Wait, did he just throw his his, uh, rest time out the window? Isn't that unhealthy? No. He was going to have his rest. But the moment demanded that he engage. And so he did. And he performs one of the greatest miracles, uh, creative miracles uh, that we see in the Bible. And so when it was over, he wasn't going to allow, listen, 20,000 people, they could have taken his time until 4 in the morning had he let him, but they didn't. Because he was going to rest. He said, disciples, love you, but you got to go. Crowd, we're done now. You got your food. Take your leftovers. I'm going to the mountains to be with my father. There's a couple things that stand out to me here. That phrase, he withdrew again. That's the one that caught me. So I I, I kind of had an idea what I was going to find. Some powerful principles on rest and withdrawing and spending time with Jesus and spending time with the Father and and being alone and being quiet in prayer. But you know what stood out to me almost just as much as that? Is the rest of Jesus' day. See, if, if it were me and I came across the lake and, and I saw all the people, my, my initial tendency would have probably been, I mean, I'd try to be like a good guy and kind of sort of do the right thing. But so it, let's say that I try to do the right thing here. And I'm like, okay, here's all these people. I got to do something. Here's what probably would come into my mind first. How much can I give to appease them without totally draining my tank? Right? Right? How much do I have to offer that they'll be happy with what I have to give without totally just like giving everything because I don't have the emotional energy for that right now? That's probably where, that's probably what I, where I would be. Jesus didn't do that. He saw the crowd and he had compassion. Compassion takes work. <laughs> He saw the crowd and he welcomed them. He saw the crowd and he took action. He saw the crowd and he got 
into the need of their life and he met the need and he engaged the need and he was, a, he was aware of the need. Which most of us never even get to that point. He engaged fully. And I look back on the rest of the day and from the very beginning, he woke up probably with a heavy heart, but he engaged his disciples when the weight of responsibility was heavy on his shoulders. He engaged the crowds that pressed in and when everybody was stretching his calendar and stretching his, 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 his schedule and pulling him in so many different directions, he engaged the individual fully. And I see that throughout the life of Jesus. Everywhere he goes, he fully engages the people that he's with. He's at a wedding, and he fully engages, and a miracle takes place. He, he's sitting at, at, on a well in Samaria, and he engages in conversation. A whole city is transformed. He, he, he's, he crosses a boat to take a rest with his disciples, and he finds a crowd, and he engages the crowd, and, and, and opens the door for incredible teaching the next day. Performs a supernatural miracle. You see, when Jesus chooses to engage, he engages fully. And when he chooses to rest, he rests fully. See, when I look at Jesus, when we observe Jesus, that's what I see. When I observe our culture, I observe my, observe my life, sometimes I see things, I see that, I don't, I don't, I just don't do that. If Jesus were alive today, um, I don't think he would ever... <laughs> If you were talking with Jesus, I don't think that he would ever, every single time his phone made a noise, do one of these guys. Oh. Yeah, oh, oh, yeah, uh-huh, yeah, uh, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, oh, yeah, sure, yep. Do you want to slap people that do that? <laughs> <clears throat> and yet we're still the one, I mean, we'd get slapped, we'd slap ourselves too often, right? I don't think Jesus would ever do that because as soon as he does, he is choosing to disengage. Maybe I can multitask. No, you can't. Um, you, he chooses to some degree. You can maybe get two things done. You can't get two things done well. He was choosing to engage with a person. When you do that, you choose to some degree to disengage. Maybe it's briefly for a second here and there, but you choose to some degree to disengage with the person that you're with. And to be honest, you owe the person you're texting more than that, too. Engage fully in what you're doing. I don't think Jesus, I don't think Jesus would ever like be sitting around like with the 12 or sitting at the Last Supper. There's kind of a lull in the conversation. So all of a sudden you have that thought, oh, that person messaged me earlier today. And I hate Facebook because they can see when I see it. And they saw that I saw it, but I didn't respond. I better respond right now. And so there's a lull in conversation. So I might as well just go ahead and, right? I don't, I don't think he would, because the moment he does that, he's choosing to disengage with those that he's presently with. I don't think that Jesus, not that I don't think he'd ever watch TV. Jesus probably would watch TV, but I, we're, we're not going to talk about that. Anyway, well, I don't, think, I don't think that Jesus, if he had one in his living room, I don't think the default mode would be on when he had company in the house. Because... Every glance causes you to disengage with the people you're around you. I don't even think that when he's waiting in the, in the doctor's office waiting room and there's a lady with two kids who are playing there next to him, I don't think he'd even check his email. Because wherever Jesus was, he was fully engaged in the present. Now listen, listen, listen. Some of you think I'm like anti-technology. I'm not. I have Facebook and smartphone and watch TV and, and, and all whatever, email, all the other stuff I just said. That's not the issue. The issue is this, is that being fully engaged is hard work. And we welcome distractions. What I mentioned just happened to be the real common distractions of our time. They're not bad. But when the things around us, be it communication, be it technology, be it something altogether different, but as soon as things are causing us to be distracted, which we love distractions because in full engagement is hard work. We, and so what happens is, is we disengage momentarily. So we go through life not fully engaged anywhere. And then when we rest, we're still distracted by the same things. 
So we never fully, we're partially engaged, and then we partially rest, and we go around this, this life tired. Maybe it can be seen this way. Let's say this is health, okay? This is a healthy energy level, okay? Let's grab it right here. This is healthy energy level right here. What Jesus would do is he would rest and he would fill up. And then he would engage people hard. Right? He would engage with everything he had. He gave all of his energy. And then he'd rest and he would fill up. And then he'd engage and he'd invest and he'd give everything he had because he knew even when he was getting low, he knew he could keep giving everything he had because there was going to be a purposeful time in his life where he would rest and he'd fill back up. But this is what we do. See, we, we have a week and we go through a work week and we're like, it's the, it's the weekend, yes. But we don't rest during the weekend. We play during the weekend, right? And we just, uh, you ever need a weekend from your weekend? You know what I mean? Like, like it, it, it was fun, but, but we start Monday and we're like depleted. Okay, there's, there's a time and place for play. I like to play. I play a lot. There's a time and place to play, but it replaces all of the rest, then it's going to be detrimental to our spiritual health. And so, so we start our week here, and we're not able to ever give our fullest. We welcome, we're, we're easily distracted because engagement is work, and we don't have the energy to work. We don't have the energy to engage. And so we're like, man, I just need a nap after work. So we go, whoop, and then we, you know, <laughs> and then we... And so finally you get to the point where you get sick and you sleep for two days. And you're like, here's health, and you sleep for two days. And you get up here and you go, man, I feel better than I've ever been before. And you're not even healthy yet. <laughs> Anybody identify or is this just me? It's not just like read your Bible and pray. Like, just like take on that spiritual obligation. This is... Friends, we have work to do. The kingdom of God in our city depends on you being fresh. Your family that doesn't know Jesus depends on you being full. Your neighborhood who is lost and is going to hell if we don't stand up and shine the light of Christ is doomed if we're living our life depleted every day. There is too much at stake. This isn't about you. So get the chip off your shoulder that says, I can muscle my way through it. You can't. Jesus couldn't. You think you're better than him? God created in six days and still rested. And you'll be, oh, I got a good three weeks in me before I need a day off. It's not about days off. It's about resting with Jesus. It's about Sabbathing every day. It's about getting away with him. It's about being quiet. Because look, look at what Jesus dealt with that morning, pain. But you know what? When you have, you're able to set aside your pain momentarily and deal and engage fully when you know there are times in your life set aside, ready to process that pain in a healthy way. I'm not saying sweep it on the carpet and then just put a, you know, put a lid on it and never address it. That's unhealthy. But I'm saying if I know that I have time to rest and recover, then I can give everything in every moment. The weight of responsibility, man, it causes us to either run so hard we hit a wall or it causes us to give up because we can't handle it all. But either way, we don't engage and we don't rest. Managing the, 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 the stresses of life and everybody pulling at us in different ways, we, we tend to just want to give up and throw up our hands. It's not about giving up and, and, and just giving in. It's about resting with purpose and intentionality to know Jesus to be refreshed by him. Listen, this isn't just about you. It's about those that we are called to engage with. Everywhere you go, you've been placed there with purpose from God on high for a reason. You need to have the spiritual, the emotional, the physical capacity to engage in every moment that you're in. And it only happens when we get away with him. God.